The year is 2043. Night Raiders dive into the dystopian reality where children are seized by the government and held as its property. The battle of a mother fighting to rescue her daughter from the camps fills this story with mystery, action, and drama proving that she'll go to the ends of the earth to get her kid back. The voiceover gives an idea of the dangers the story brings. Among the heavy and dark forest, a little girl, Wassis, talks to a bird that she's supposed to eliminate, but it flies away. Wassis and her mother, Niska, walk around the forest looking for prey, but the girl becomes it. She falls into a trap and her foot gets badly hurt. Both mom and daughter are frightened. At home, a tiny cabin in the woods, Niska makes sure Wassis is comfortable and watches over her worried about her leg. Flashing lights and uncontrolled wind around their house make Niska go outside. She hides from the light, a surveillance drone, and aims to shoot it down. Niska and Wassis rush out of the house leaving no tracks behind, but a pile of ashes. They burn the cabin down. It's clear that Niska had planned everything. She knew such a thing would happen so she made sure to be ready to respond accordingly. They disappear into the woods until they reach a river. There, there's a small boat strategically placed to aid mom and daughter in times of need. Quickly they arrive in what resembles a city that once had a lively population, but that now shows nothing but scraps and abandoned properties. Niska and Wasis are careful not to make sudden moves or noise. They don't know what or who might be watching. Niska hears the sound of a radio coming from the huge speakers on the street informing that any strange behavior and any sign of children around the city should be reported to the government. A middle-aged man sees them trying to enter an abandoned house. Niska activates the warrior mom mode, but quickly the man confides to her his son is a teenager. They are both parents that are protecting their children from the devastating future that waits for them. The next day, Wassis goes around the house to know the ground where they're standing. She has difficulty walking due to her hurt ankle. Wassis and Niska seem to have the power to move according to the wind. They can go easily unnoticed, and that's a key element for survival in that inhospitable environment. Wassi sees the young boy she met the night before walking towards the street and she observes him. He does the same. They communicate through their eyes, and the boy leads Wassi to the carcass of a drone that had been shot. The boy tells her not to worry, the drone has been broken for a long time. But Wassi was raised connected to her senses more than anyone and identifies a tiny frequency of sound. The drone goes back up and alerts authorities that there are underage people in that location. Wassi manages to hide, but the boy isn't as well trained as she is and gets caught by law enforcement. His father is powerless and can't help his child. Niska and Wassis run away promptly. Although strong and driven, both mom and daughter have to stop for a few seconds to give Wassis some time to rest her broken leg. They are surrounded by high buildings with trashed glass windows and filled with nothing but the howling wind. They reach an imponent and rusty metal wall that looks a lot like a prison wall. The radio can be heard again as Niska and Wassis walk through narrow alleys trying to pass unnoticed. They see a police officer heavily armed, and Wassis covers her face. A large screen on the wall advertises the regime imposed against minors as some sort of sanctuary for children and teenagers to thrive and have better lives. Niska knows that's a lie, and they keep walking. Finally, they arrive at a door that hides a woman and her home behind it. Niska calls for Roberta, who quickly answers the door giving mom and child shelter. The women greet each other after a long time apart. Roberta is in awe of Wassis. Even though Roberta is older and more experienced than Niska, she thanks Niska for teaching her how to survive having nature around her, a reality that is native to Niska and Wassis, but not to Roberta. The three women, each living in different periods of womanhood, find some comfort in petting a cute cat. It looks like seconds of not remembering what their lives have become. Niska gives details of how badly hurt Wassis is and asks for Roberta's help to find medicine. Their odds are against them, but the girl's leg is already infected. She needs help. Roberta updates Niska on what's going on in that forsaken urban area and asks her where Niska and Wassis want to go. Niska is not sure but intends to go back to the woods. Roberta argues that Wassis can have a better light by sending her to school and tells Niska that her son is doing just fine. Niska is completely against the idea. The rain outside gives the conversation an even more dramatic energy. Roberta confesses that her son is doing much better at Emerson's than he would be with her. It sounds like she is trying to convince Niska that she made the right decision, but mostly, she's trying to convince herself of that. Niska is uncomfortable and confused. She wants what's best for her child, but she doesn't want to give her away. Niska wakes up startled by the police searching the people. Wassis has a fever and Niska is desperate. She gathers courage and approaches the police saying that there's a minor in the house and that she's sick. Niska is desolated. Time passes by and ten months later, Niska's life seems precarious and ordinary as it was before. Regret is printed all over her face. At the street market, she meets Randy who offers her some kind of job, but doesn't get into details. They schedule to meet at the zoo to discuss it better. Niska is not excited about it. Niska leaves the market to pay tributes to her daughter at a modest and hidden sanctuary. Back home, she sees strange movements around the place. There has been an attack on Emerson's stations. At Emerson, Wassis participates in the training that happens routinely. 
Niska meets Randy in a kind of nightclub, and he tells her that he managed to get citizenship from a clandestine group. Niska is interested and uneasy. At Emerson's, Wessie struggles with routine and social isolation. She feels like her spirit is wasting away in that place. She can't sleep, and neither can Niska back in the woods. She goes for a walk and the cold wind on her face makes it difficult to breathe, but she's used to it. She is surprised by the visit of a lost horse and spots people sneaking out of a guarded facility. She sees children running and an adult about to reach them. Niska jumps on the man's back in an effort to save the children. The man knocks her down and takes her to his group. She is interrogated by a woman and taken to another room. The middle-aged woman seems to be the leader of the group and suspects Niska's identity. The woman's face lit up with hope. She leaves the tent to talk to the ancient ones. Around a fire, people chat, narrating life stories, and get warm. Niska is addressed by an elderly lady who reveals that they have been waiting for Niska for a long time. She claims that Niska is a guardian. Niska is confused and extremely sad. The crowd turns to her and welcomes her presence. It seems like they have been researching for her. She belongs to their tribe, to their people. She is trying to convince herself that she's home with those people, but remains restless. At night, while everyone is asleep, she checks on the tents one by one. She's being followed. The woman who interrogated her asks her questions about her daughter. It's morning and Niska takes a better look at the dimension of the tribe's camp. She wants to keep searching for her daughter and asks to talk to the children the group has rescued. The woman in charge proposes to Niska a deal. They rescue Wassis and, in return, Niska takes the rescued children to a safer place called Big Stone. Niska is reluctant, but the group tells her that it's the only way to save the kids from Emerson's cruel indoctrination. Niska learns that the children go through a brainwashing process and disassociate from their real lives completely. The group keeps trying to convince Niska to take the kids since she's the only guardian available who knows how to live from the land. At the academy, Wassis observes how traumatized the children become every day. She sees a little bird and it reminds her of her free and wild spirit. She gathers the courage to fight and run from that place, but as she runs away the alarms ring and she's captured. Niska comes back home to the abandoned building, but sees her neighbor deceased on the street. Randy runs to her covering her face, Roberta is with. He tells her that there's a virus now that's killing people fast. Randy says that the borders will be closed to contain the virus, so they speed up to get away, but the police apprehend them. From the bus, Roberta sees Pierre, her son, and loses control. The police officers, gun pointed, demand that she goes back to her seat. Everyone is desperate now. Out of nowhere a gas strikes the bus, and the police officers become disoriented. Randy, Niska, and Roberta leave the bus to find Pierre pointing a gun at them. Roberts reasons with her son, who doesn't recognize her. He's been brainwashed. Pierre shoots her and Randy, but Randy survives. Niska is rescued by the tribe members who finally convince her to get the children to Big Stone as soon as they get her daughter back. The group heads to Wassis's rescue and, on their way there, tells Niska the story about their elders' visions of a guardian coming from the north and assuring their people's survival. Wassis is in solitaire confinement and is taken back to her dormitory for questioning. She now answers by the name of Elizabeth. Wassis goes back to her training. The girls are learning how to assemble heavy guns. Wassis is skilled. She is considered the strongest in her class and learns that she will be transferred to Emerson's highest station. She pledges allegiance to Emerson. Niska is back at the tribe site.